Uh, first of all, good morning. My name is Peter Simpson. I'm head of food technology here at, uh, at CAFRI at the Lockery campus. And uh, you're very welcome to our information dissemination event here at CAFRI uh, with our partners in the Food Standards Agency. So the aim of this uh, short but hopefully informative webinar this morning is to allow you to check if your business is likely to be affected by the new allergen labeling requirements, which will be poignantly uh, known uh, as Natasha's law. So this morning, we hope, we hope to establish some of the specifics of the food prepacked for direct sale legislation without losing sight of its purpose. And that's to improve the quality of life for those people who have allergen hypersensitivity and allow those individuals to make more informed food choices. So before we start our seminar, I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, comments on housekeeping. So just to note that this event is being recorded and will appear on the CAFRI and FSA websites uh, following the event. And just to reassure those who are attending, uh, we can't see you. Uh, you, you, are, uh, you cannot be seen by any of the other attendees either, so um, your identity is protected. If, uh, as we would really like you to do, um, we'd like you to participate in, in this, this seminar. And to do that, we have a Q&A function within this platform uh, known as WebEx. And perhaps this is the first time many of you have used it but the q a function is very useful and we would really encourage you to ask questions as the uh, event progresses rather than leave them to the very end because we want to maximize uh, our q a session at the end of the event we also have a, have a chat function within webex and really what we'd like you to use that for is is to uh, contact uh, us if you have any technical difficulties in joining uh, the event or if you're losing audio for some reason during the course of the event that would be very useful for us to know and we will do our best to, to try and, uh, and fix that so i'm just going to give you a quick overview of uh, of our agenda this morning we're going to kick off with a little bit of a background into natasha's law uh, from tim mclachlan then we're going to have some specifics on what we need to do to comply with the new legislation. Uh, and that will be delivered by our friends, Nula and Steve from the Food Standards Agency. We'll welcome later then uh, a County Down businessman who will share his experience of actually putting PPDS into practice ahead of the, the deadline for the legislation. We'll finish off uh, the, the series of speakers with a short presentation on what we can do to help you with your legislation and labeling requirements at CAFRI. And then we'll look forward to uh, some uh, live Q&A sessions uh, with an expert panel. And as I say, we're really grateful we've received some questions in advance. And we'll look forward to some of the questions that you as attendees will uh, would like to uh, put to the panel um, during the course of the meeting. So as I say, please feel free to load those questions in at any stage as we, as we progress. So I am going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Tim McLaughlin is Chief Executive of the Natasha Allergy Research Foundation. And we're going to look a little bit into the background on Natasha's law. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Peter. May I check? Can you hear me? Excellent. So I'm going to share a few slides and these will be available as well as one of the little videos I'm going to show. Um, but the first thing to say is thank you to CAFRI and to the FSA for inviting Natasha's Foundation uh, to be part of this seminar today. So I'm just going to try and share my screen. May I check? Can you see the full screen or is it still the notes screen? Could you give me a note, Peter? 
Tim, we're just looking at the notes screen at the moment, um, okay. but it's it's relatively clear, so that that's it. We're perfect now. That's it. There we go. Splendid. Thank you very much. So Natasha's foundation was created following the inquest into the death of Natasha Ednan Laparus, who so tragically died back in 2016. Many of you will remember the coverage of that tragedy uh, in the press where she had eaten a baguette bought at an airport, which did not list the ingredients. And she had a number of severe food allergies and it contained sesame baked into the dough. Following her tragic death and inquest, her parents Nadine and Tanya campaigned for a change in the law to make sure that at least the food allergens and actually now full ingredient labelling is included on all foods termed pre-packed for direct sale. And in the next section, we're going to go into the detail about what that means and, and what foods are covered by that legislation. But my main message to you this morning is this. Natasha's law is not about labelling, it's about life and death. That's why we're here to stop any further tragedies happening again and to increase the number of safe food choices that anyone with a food hypersensitivity, whether it's a life threatening allergy, a life impacting uh, intolerance or other hypersensitivity. So Natasha's foundation, there's our vision on the screen. Our goal is to make allergy history. So what is the scale of the problem? Well, there's some numbers on the screen for you. I believe that we all know, love or are someone affected by food allergy. And I'm hoping that Zeta will be able to uh, put up some poll questions which might appear. Thank you, Zeta. So if you could have a go at answering those, they're completely anonymous as Peter has said, um, but just answer each of those, I'd be very grateful and we'll come back for the results a little later. So the numbers are that up to 3 million people in the UK have a food allergy. For children, that's up to 8%, and that's the equivalent of one child in every class in every school. Two to three million people is the total covering adults. And the number is going up of people affected by food allergy because there's been an increase uh, in A&E admissions, amongst other measures, there's it on the screen there, 615% uh, in the 10 year or 20 years between 92 and 2012. And that figure will have risen in the last nine years as well. So more people are being admitted to hospital with food anaphylaxis. And think of it like this, a food allergen acts like a deadly poison to someone with a food allergy. It's not a lifestyle choice, it's not being fussy, it's an immune system response where just like a small amount of deadly poison, your body attacks it in such a way that the reaction can kill. And the other message I want to share with you is that a food allergy can develop at any age in anyone. It's not a lifestyle choice, as I've said, and it's not food intolerance. And now food allergies are a major concern. So thank you for uh, completing the poll. We'll leave that up for just a little bit longer. But what I want to just outline to you is what is anaphylaxis? Well, anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction where your body goes into a response to an allergen it's ingested. And there are some of the symptoms on the screen there. And the rapid swelling of throat tissues, the increase in asthma type symptoms can be deadly. We see an average of about one person a month dying because of an anaphylactic reaction to food, and it is preventable. It's a terrifying situation when it happens. And I'd just like to tell you, if you ever find yourself in the, that position, please do these things. Firstly, the only treatment to lessen the body's response is an adrenaline injection. That can either be done in a hospital, but many people with a food allergy carry an adrenaline auto injector, an EpiPen, or a Jext or an Emirates. There are a number of brands available. Use that, and at the same time, call 999 and follow their instructions. You can inject it through clothing, and you can ask someone who has a food allergy to show you, and training pens are available. And make sure the person lies down flat, and then if another injection is needed, do that. And often the injection is best done into the muscle of the thigh. So if you're thinking about first aid, please consider 
making sure that you've watched a quick video on how to administer an adrenaline auto injector. It could save a life just like um, CPR or a defibrillator. So I mentioned to you that food allergy can start in anyone at any age. And that is best illustrated by the number of people that we've seen who are developing allergies later in life, having eaten foods they've eaten for many years. I'll give you a quick example. Um, a gentleman who works in catering um, had been uh, eating corn products all his life um, and he developed a corn allergy in his late 40s. And this was very surprising to him and no one could explain it because in his 20s he'd lived in Mexico and so actually had been eating a corn product nearly every day. So they can develop in any age at any one and we don't know why. But why do we get food allergy? What's causing it? What's driving it? Well, it's an immune response, as I've mentioned. An immunoglobin E is the allergy antibody. We have many antibodies and we all are a bit more informed about those with the vaccines and COVID that uh, we've been living with. But allergy antibody immunoglobin E has been subverted. The body has been changed somehow to attack common proteins. It's doing its job. This is what attacks things when we eat uh, things like worms or parasites, which thankfully we don't choose to do or, or accidentally do very often these days. But it's the development of our body that's given us this protection. But now it starts attacking common proteins, common proteins in egg and milk and peanuts, treatments we know of. And there are actually 170 known food allergens, not just the 14 prescribed in law, but this change to our immune system means food allergies will continue to increase. The body started, and it's going to carry on attacking common proteins. I've mentioned that a severe allergic reaction anaphylaxis acts like a deadly poison and it can kill in minutes. That's how serious it can be. And the real challenge is we don't know how severe a next reaction to intake an allergen accidentally might be. It could be severe, it could not, but you've got, be, got to be prepared for the severity and hence the carrying of the EpiPens, the AAIs. I'm just going to hand back to Zeta, who's kindly going to try and play this video about Natasha's Law, which is available um, on YouTube and, and through our website. Thank you, Zeta. Natasha was Natasha's law is really important for British society um, and what it's about uh, is about food labelling on pre-packaged for direct sale food. It sounds a bit complicated but it's not at all. This is all uh, relevant to food that is actually made on the premises of a particular uh, sandwich shop for example and then pre-packaged before it's sold to the public. So it's a pre-packaged food for direct sale and Natasha's law is all about covering uh, the labelling that relates to the ingredients of that food and also highlighting the 14 allergens uh, on that food as well. Natasha's law means that all prepackaged food, whether it's made in a factory or if it's made on site, will have to include all the ingredients so that anybody looking at the label on the packaging will know exactly what they're buying and therefore they can make a good decision as to whether or not that's safe for them. So currently, uh, food producers who, who make food that are pre-packaged for direct sale on the premises don't actually have to adhere to any laws or regulations that, that uh, mean they have to put any ingredients on. And that, I think, to a lot of people would be quite a shock, as it, as it really was to us. I think it was unbelievable we found that out. I think all our lives we believed that uh, what, whatever they needed to be said would be put on the packaging, as we see when we buy food in a supermarket that's packaged. It's not at all the case in sandwich shops around the country. In our family's case, Natasha bought a sandwich, or we bought a sandwich together actually at the airport, and it was pre-packaged, so it looked rather like a supermarket sandwich, and there was what I call partial information on it, so it gave some of the ingredients on the sandwich, but not all of it. So in many ways, we've, we were kind of lulled into a sense of false security, and this is the big problem. When you're buying and you're moving on the go and you're buying food, you make decisions quickly. So you don't lull on it and just think for hours and end about it. It's fast. And if there's information there, you read it and you take it at face value. And there's a trust element there. And in this case, that trust, well, 
that trust cost us our daughter's life. It's really important that Tasha's law comes into force and those things do change, that uh, people with allergies are properly protected, like they should be, and not second-class citizens. It's outrageous. This is covering a law that existed that was never really meant for large chains that prepackage food, and it's really tightening it and making it safe so that ultimately it can save people's lives. Thank you, Zita. Just got a, um, a few more slides to share with you. I'll just go back to these. And hopefully they're the right way round. We know they're not. We'll make sure. There we go. That should be the right way round now again. Yep, thank you, Peter. An absolute tragedy led to the need for this law. And I'd just like to add at this point a thank you. A thank you to all of you who have responded as businesses, as individuals, to be ready for the 1st of October. We know that this isn't the best time. COVID has, has turned our world upside down for many people. And that is why this actually it feels to some people it may be a bit too much at this time, but it's not. My big message to you is this is not about labelling. It's about life and death because nobody wants to see a tragedy like this happen again. And that's the timeline of where we are today. So the creation of the foundation and then the Tasha's law being implemented. Our big focus, as I mentioned at the start, is on research. We want to eradicate food allergy. And the other things that we do, as well as the research, looking to actually make sure that there's no more food allergy developing is, we want to understand what are the causes of it, make sure treatments are available, and policy change. Natasha's law is the start, but so much more needs to be done. Allergy needs to be a priority, and calling for full ingredient labelling and eliminating food allergens is what we are doing. And we want to raise awareness of the life-threatening danger of allergies. And I hope today what I've said has done some of that. So I've got three more slides. Takeaway messages for you. The number of people affected by food allergy is high. Three million adults and one child in every class in every school. A second message for you to take away is that it as a food allergy, we are all affected. This isn't about other people. And Zeta, could we possibly see the results of the poll of the questions that you kindly answered? So there we go. So I have a food allergy myself. Got no, the majority say no, but there is a small proportion there. I'm going to guess between 5% um, or 10% there was. It's 10%, 9 out of 155 compared to 98. So 10% of you have a food allergy yourself. A member of my close family has an allergy. Well, that's increased. I mean, that's getting close to what, 40%. And I know someone with a food allergy, and now we're at the majority. Look at that. So we all know someone with a food allergy. And it's not just about that um, individual, that person. It's about the entire family. It affects all of their food choices. So perhaps one of the commercial messages to take away is, if we adapt and are inclusive for people with allergy, we are not excluding people that we could sell food to. It's about being inclusive and actually making sure we don't close off part of our market. So my final message to you, my big message to you is, Natasha's law is not about labelling, it's about life and death. Please, if you take one thing away from my presentation, remember that, and with all the preparations you're doing, know that that's the benefit, that's why of Natasha's law. So my final slide is just to leave you with, there's our website. If you'd like to know more about our work, please consider supporting us and funding our research because one day we will make allergy history starting with food allergy. Thank you uh, for your help Zita with that. And Peter, I'd like to hand back to you. Thank you, Tim. Um, thank you. That, that's uh, it's really important to hear the human story be behind the, the need for this legislation. So. 
Let's take it on a little further. And uh, I'm going to hand over now to our friends at the Food Standards Agency. We have uh, Nula Meehan uh, and Steve Eddy to, to uh, spell out how we need to get ready to implement um, new legislation and labelling for prepacked foods for direct sale. Thanks, Peter. Um, Zita, if you could move on to the next slide, please. That's perfect, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nuala Meehan, and I'm the Food Standards Lead for Safety and Regulatory Compliance at the FSA in Northern Ireland. So, um, as has already been mentioned this morning, from the 1st of October, there are changes to the requirements for PPDS food labelling. And with a few months to go until implementation, we're here today to give an overview of these changes. Um, but to echo what Tim said, um, the new labelling requirements will help to protect your consumers by providing potentially life-saving allergen information on the packaging. Um, and before I go into the detail of the presentation, I'd like to ask you another polling question. So, if Zita, if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide. Um, it's a simple yes or no answer to this one. So, have you started preparing for PPDS? Um, I can see it coming up on the side of my screen now. So, um, do you would be able to answer that, and we can come back to it at the end of uh, my section of the presentation. Um, so, moving on to the next slide. Um, as I said, we are here today to talk about the new rules for PPDS food. So we will start with the current rules for pre-packed and non-pre-packed food. So for pre-packed food, regulations specify that pre-packed food is packed by one business and supplied to another business, or is packed by the same business at a different site. So pre-packed food must be labelled with the full ingredients list with any of the 14 major allergens emphasised on the ingredients list. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, any food that is not pre-packed is considered non-pre-packed. For non-pre-packed food, food businesses currently have a choice in how they provide allergen information on the 14 major allergens. It can be provided in written form, verbally, or a combination of the two. Um, and it's important for businesses to sign post people to where they can obtain this allergen information. Next slide, please. Um, uh, the term, what is PPDS food? So the term PPDS applies to food that is packed before being offered for sale by the same food business to the final consumer. And um, this would be food that is packed on the same premises or on the same site. Uh, it also applies to food that is packed on other premises if the food is offered for sale from a movable and or temporary premises if the food is offered for sale by the same food business who packed it. It doesn't include food that is packed at a customer's request, food that's not in packaging, or food in packaging that can be altered without opening or changing the packaging. So for PPDS, food is considered pre-packed when it is put into packaging before being offered for sale, and the food is fully or partly enclosed by the packaging. The contents cannot be altered without opening or changing the packaging. And the food is a single item that is ready for sale to the final consumer. So some examples of what is PPDS food, that is any food, a completely packaged in cling film, bread, which is placed in a paper bag with the bag folded over or twisted to encase the bread, sweets contained in a plastic bag that is tied with a knot or sealed. Um, it's important to note that packaging for PPDS food does not need to be sealed to meet this definition. It can include, for example, bags that are folded over or twisted or boxes that have tabs to shut them. Um, so the FSA has produced a really useful decision tool, which is available on our website to help businesses identify if any of the food they offer is PPDS. The tool goes through three key questions, which are, is the food presented to the final customer in packaging? Is it packaged before the customer selects or orders it? Is it packaged in the same place that it is sold? So if any business can answer yes to all three questions, then the food is PPDS. Um, so as I said, this is available on our website and there's a link in the slides here today that will bring you through. So it's a really useful tool. Um, and so other examples of pre-packed food. So, for example, sandwiches packaged by the food business and sold or offered from the same premises, bakery products which are packaged before a customer selects them, fast food which is wrapped or packaged before a customer selects or orders it, 
supermarket products, uh, those that are produced and packaged in store, such as pizzas, rotisserie chicken, and baked products. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, moving on to the next slide, with this this slide shows examples of food that is not PPDS. So food that is not in packaging or food that is only packaged at the customer's request is non-prepacked, so not PPDS. And um, food that is packaged at a different premises is also not PPDS, rather it is pre-packed food. Um, it's also worth noting that the new labelling requirements don't apply to PPDS food, which is sold by means of distant selling, such as food which is purchased through the telephone or over the internet. So food sold in this way will need to ensure that the mandatory allergen information is available to the consumer before they purchase the product and also at the moment of delivery. So from the 1st of October, PPDS food must display the following information, either on the package or on a label attached to the package. So the name of the food and an ingredients list, including the 14 mandatory allergens. The mandatory allergens within the food must be emphasized every time they appear on the ingredients list. For example, the allergens in the food can be listed in capitals or bold, underlined, or in a contrasting color. So Moving on to the labelling requirements for PPDS. In terms of labelling, um, one of the key items is the name of the food. Where food names are prescribed in law, they must be used. But just to note, this mainly applies to food containing certain seafood, fish and meat ingredients. Um, if no name is provided in law, customary names, which are commonly used and understood, can be used, such as a BLT sandwich. Where there is not a customary name, the name used must be descriptive and inform the customer of the true nature of the food. So um, the ingredients list shall be headed by a suitable heading which consists of or includes the word ingredients. The list shall include all ingredients of the food in descending order of weight as recorded at the time of their use in the manufacture of the food. Um, as I said before, if the product contains any of the 14 allergens, they must be clearly highlighted on the listed ingredients. Alternative allergen statements such as contains wheat, egg and milk are not permitted. So some po points to note on the format of the and font of the label. Um, the information must appear on the package or on a label attached to the package. It must be easily visible and clear to read. Um, it must be on the outside of the product and not obscured in any way. It must not be difficult to read. Um, the ingredients list has to comply with the minimum requirements of fonts, which are outlined on this slide. Labels can also be handwritten, but they need to ensure that they meet the font requirements. They're easily visible and are clear to read. So some practical considerations relating to your labels. So should a business decide to use printed labels, um, there are multiple options that they could consider when deciding how to label their PPDS products. Uh, software solutions or labeling programs with printers could be used as well as pre-printed packaging. Uh, businesses may want to proactively plan for any incidents such as malfunctions. For example, they may wish to consider having some pre-printed labels to use in these circumstances that accurately describe the allergens and ingredients. Um, as mentioned in the slide before, labels can also be handwritten as long as they meet the legal font size requirements and are easily visible and clear to read. Um, so in terms of information that businesses get from their suppliers, it's really important to emphasize today that the existing requirements for passing information along the chain continue to apply. Food businesses and their suppliers already have an obligation to ensure that accurate ingredient and allergen information is passed to consumers. So suppliers are legally responsible for passing on accurate information on ingredients and allergens to other food businesses. Um, food businesses should also ensure that they have processes in place to update this information should they change suppliers or when ingredients change. Um, when talking about PPDS food, it's also important to consider the use of voluntary or precautionary allergen labelling, such as may contain statements. It may contain statements and precautionary allergen label outline to consumers the unintentional presence of allergens, usually from unavoidable cross-contamination. For PPDS food, the FSA advises that these type of statements are best placed on the label. However, for PPDS food, 
operators can also communicate this information differently, for example, verbally by staff or in writing with signs on display. And um, this information should only be provided if there is a real risk of allergen cross contact, which has been identified following a thorough risk assessment. Precautionary allergen information from ingredients suppliers must must be passed on to the consumer. Um, and also important to note that the use of precautionary allergen labeling when there is no real risk could be considered misleading food information, which reduces the choice for a food hypersensitive consumer, this should not be used as a general disclaimer. So, just before, before I finish up, um, we have a few illustrative examples. So, in example number one here, we, in the case of a deli bar, if a customer orders a freshly filled baguette, which is then put into packaging, does it need a label? And the answer to that is, if you make the baguette to order, put it in packaging after the customer orders it, you do not need to label the baguette with the ingredient and allergen information. However, you must provide information about the allergens present in the baguette, either orally or by means of a menu, a ticket or a sign. However, if you do prepack the baguettes in anticipation for a lunchtime rush, then this would be PPDS. And the second example, it looks at a home baker who bakes cakes to order for individuals. Do they need to comply? Um, the answer to this is no. If the cakes are made to order, so are uh, so not prepacked before the consumer orders them. Um, if the cakes are sold through distance selling, such as over the internet or by telephone, allergen information must be available before the cakes are ordered and when they are delivered. Uh, this will not be affected by the new regulations. So in my final example, um, we're looking at the example of a school um, at lunchtime when food is plated on demand, do they have to list all the ingredients? So if you're plating freshly cooked food, which is not pre-packed before the point that it is ordered, then there is no need to list the ingredients. You must be able to provide information in writing or orally on the presence of any allergens in the food you're serving. Any food that is packed on the same site before being ordered by the student will need to provide the name of the food and an ingredients list with allergens emphasized on its packaging or a label fixed to its packaging. So just before I hand over to Steve, who's going to cover the remainder of this presentation, I'd like to look at the answers to the polling question, which um, oh, thank you, Zita has put up now. So have you started preparing for PPDS? 39 percent. Um, well, ha we got half of the uh, responses with 39% of the 50% saying yes and 17 who answered saying no. But hopefully um, listening to our presentation today will um, help get you started on your pr preparedness for PPDS. And so I'm just going to pass over to Steve now. Thank you all very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Lewis AD and I'm a policy manager within the Food Standards Agency's regulatory policy team in Wales. Uh, this role covers uh, making legislation, common frameworks, labelling issues, and of course, PPDS. I'm also a uh, qualified trading standards officer. I'm going to talk to you today about the compliance and enforcement aspects of these changes. I'll be touching upon, next slide please, um, the who will enforce the new PPDS requirements, the District Council enforcement approach, assessing allergen compliance, what an inspection will include, and District Council enforcement options. I'll start, however, with a polling question, and at the end of my section, I'll summarize the results. So the polling question for me, if it can be shown, please, Ita, um, is have you been contacted by your District Council in relation to the PPDS changes? If so, how? And as you can see, there's a number of potential options that you could choose from. So whilst you are making those choices, I'll continue with my presentation. Next slide, please. So in terms of who will enforce the new PPDS requirements, the District Council roles and responsibilities, District Councils in, in Northern Ireland are the competent authorities for food safety and food labelling rules. And they will enforce the new PPDS requirements. For advice or potential advisory visits, 
contact your environmental health department food safety team within your local council environmental health officers in northern ireland carry out both food hygiene and food standards inspections therefore during any visit your environmental health officer may check on compliance with these new rules at the bottom of each slide we've included some supporting guidance so as you can see there you've got the the regulations that have made these PPDS changes. Next slide, please. In terms of the district council enforcement approach, food business operators can obtain advice and guidance from district councils and via published FSA guidance. Where district councils find that the PPDS labeling requirements are not being complied with, they should take a proportionate and risk-based approach to enforcement. District councils will take account of, amongst other things, the seriousness of any non-compliances and the attitude and willingness of the food business to correct any problems. That is to say, district councils should take a graduated, proportionate approach based upon the food law code of practice and their enforcement policies. And again, at the bottom of this slide, you've got a link to the food law code of practice in Northern Ireland. Next slide, please. In terms of assessing allergen compliance, it's a fundamental part of every food standards and food hygiene intervention where it's relevant, including for low risk businesses where alternative enforcement strategies may be used and when officers are conducting non-official controls. Alternative enforcement strategies include um, a questionnaire that may be sent to businesses uh, asking uh, about the type of business that they operate and then when the environmental health service receive it back in this instance they will assess the results of the questionnaire and determine whether a visit or an inspection is required you can have you can expect to have discussions on allergen management within your business during any intervention or visit from your environmental health officer next slide please so in terms of what an inspection will include, district council officers may cover the following areas. So when they're looking at food that you're selling, they'll be looking at whether the foods are impacted by the new PPDS requirements. Whether they're correctly labeled, do they bear the name of the food, an ingredients list, have the allergens been emphasized? How do you make or package these foods? What equipment do you use? What areas are you using within your premises? Do, do you have packing lines? Are you making different products on the same packing lines? How are you cleaning your equipment uh, and the areas that you use within your premises and equipment to prevent any cross-contamination and the potential for allergens to become embedded into food products? How do you prevent cross-contamination during storage and processing, keeping goods segregated from each other, et cetera? What allergen and ingredient information do you receive from your suppliers? Your record keeping, and that may be needed for traceability purposes if allergens are subsequently found to be contained within a product and a product recall may be necessary. Next slide, please. In terms of district council enforcement options, as we've said, the district councils follow the food law code of practice, but each district council will also have a, an enforcement policy. And in, in, in terms of their enforcement policy, it will set out the enforcement options available to them. But that will include um, issuing advice and guidance, issuing warnings, cautions, and in the most serious cases, uh, undertaking prosecutions. Fines for breaching the allergen requirements of PBDS can be unlimited. District councils will decide what course of action to take based upon the merits of each case. And the legislation at the bottom of this slide is the uh, Food Information Regulations 2014. That's the end of my presentation, um, but I'll now look at the polling results. Just wait for them to come up. So in terms of having been contacted by your district council, we've got 30 out of 158 who've had an email. 
um, 958 have been contacted by through webinars or online. Um, we've got social media contacts for 7 out of 158. 12 out of 158 have had information via inspections, some fact sheets, some other not contacted, 16 out of 158, and no answer, 78 out of 158. Okay, um, moving on to resources available. Next slide, please. Prior to going on to look at the resources, I'll ask one more polling question. And this one would be, where would it be most useful for your business to find information on the PPDS rules? And again, you've got a number of options. And whilst you consider those options, I'll move on to the next slide, please. And the next slide is beginning to show you some of the resources that's available to help you to comply with the PPDS requirements. So you've got a picture there of the food allergen and labeling requirements technical guidance. And in blue at the top, you've got the link to it. That will provide uh, very good detailed information in terms of how you can comply. There's also a food allergy training resource available for businesses. And again, the, the link in blue will take you to that. Next slide, please. The FSA have created a dedicated part of the FSA website for PPDS and that's www.food.gov.uk forward slash PPDS. Now, in that section, you'll find uh, a PPDS toolkit. You'll find sector-specific guidance, allergens and ingredients, food labeling decision uh, tool, which Nula mentioned earlier. In terms of the sector-specific guidance, so far, the FSA has published a guide for bakers, a guide for butchers, mobile sellers, street vendors, fast food and takeaways, schools, colleges and, and nurseries, restaurants, cafes and pubs, and a sector guide for caterers will be published shortly. Um, questions on PPDS can be sent to the FSA via the email address ppds at food.gov.uk. We, we're happy to receive questions following this webinar, but the general approach to take should be a hierarchical approach in, in terms of finding out this information and initially check for guidance on the resources that we've, we've mentioned. Check with any trade association membership that you have um, who may be able to help and advise you. You may be part of regional groups, so discuss it with them. Then think about contacting your local authority, environmental health office, to ask them the query that you have. If you are still unable to find an appropriate answer to the query at that stage, then please contact the FSA. Underneath the uh, at the bottom of the slide here, we've got the food information amendments outlined outlined in the PPDS rules for each nation. So you can see that this is a list of the regulations that were made that brought in the PPDS changes. If we can now look at the polling question. So where would it be most useful to find the information that you require in, in respect to PPDS? 48 of 158, I would believe uh, local authority, 69 out of 158, the Food Standards Agency, and small amounts then for Google, social media, and trade associations. That ends my part of the presentation, and I'll pass it back to Peter. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nula and Steve. And it's uh, really good to know that there's uh, there's some helpful resources out there. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, James <coughs> James Cunningham. James runs a very successful uh, business in County Down and has already started his preparations for PPDS. So we're going to hear it straight from a, a business person uh, on the, the complexities of what this legislation will mean for, for, a, for a business. So over to you, James. Hey, Peter. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. 
I'm sure you've heard from the Christy so far, there's a, a lot of help out there for, for businesses ranging across the whole food sector. Uh, just a wee brief history, I'm James from Cummings Butchers in Food Hall in Kilkeel and County Down. We are a small family business established 101 years ago and uh, we have seen enormous growth in the last 10 years from the pre packed side of our business. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, see that just for uh, we've pre packed growth has probably been one of the major uh, factors in uh, the growth for business in 2010. We had uh, three staff today, we have just over 60. So, uh, without uh, pre packed foods, you know, it's, it's very hard for, for food businesses to really capture their whole market. Uh, so, we, we noticed very early 2011 2012. Uh, a change in trend in customers. Customers are now, as what we would call time poor, and uh, a lot of houses, both both partners are working. So two, three o'clock in the day, they actually don't know what they're going to have for dinner. So the pre bag option uh, is, a, is a wonderful way for, for your customer base to come in and uh, see a product, see a product they like, and to offer a, a mealtime solution uh, of a quality home cooked product that uh, you know they they are confident. So uh, seeing this, we uh, utilise the advice of our HO. We've a great relationship with our HO, Adrian Simmons down here in uh, Morn. And as far back as 2011, he was very much making us aware of best practice in, in ingredient declarations and origins. So with, with the growth uh, potential that we hope for in in, in the pre packed of business, we definitely took a very proactive uh, uh, decision with the business to invest in the labeling side of our business. Uh, the first thing we did was outsource help. Uh, it's very important, I feel, that uh, in many businesses, it's, it's, we're all <laughs> trying our best to be as busy as we can. And if you don't have time to to, to follow uh, the legislation, get help. You know, don't be afraid to uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very much worthwhile investment. If you don't want to invest, as you see, there's, there's the FSA and all of a number of guidelines there that they're going to be able to, to give you uh, as much advice they can on. But from a from a physical actually getting the product uh, to market and making sure that everything you have on that product is correct, I definitely would advise uh, getting help, uh, definitely in the initial stage, to set up a process of where you're confident that what you're putting on your product is, is right and uh, that your customers have the confidence in, in buying your product knowing that everything you're putting on that product is is right so uh, the develop the first thing we do in any business is, 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 is develop a product so we're all looking for unique products that unique customers want to come to us so we uh, it's a big big part of our business is the the range and products we have and the quality products we have so we have teams in different departments with our butcher department or cooking department or ready to eat department. So what we do is like, we would sit down and we brainstorm. So we create a product, for example, a, a unique pie. We would get different ingredients together, let the chefs do their thing, and uh, tasting, retasting, redoing. And once you are fully happy with the, the product you develop, that's where you then need to have the process in place to evaluate that product from every single stage of development. So you know that you every ingredient in that product is, is 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 documented and then you're able to get all the information from every ingredient in that product onto your label and what's the allergen advice what we do is we then when we do a product we evaluate each stage and get all the ingredients together we send that off to uh, our outsource company who then bring the ingredients together bring the allergies together send it back and we update our allergen database and uh, once you have that done uh, strict recipe compliance is key you know the next few things we'll talk about is uh, the most critical in terms of on the ground for every business. We have uh, a recipe booklet for every single pre packed product uh, that we put out in the business. So uh, we teach different teams on at different times of the day. Uh, uh, people often holiday. There's a recipe booklet that is the the, the go to for, for every single product on that. Uh, in that booklet, for example, I'll mention the pie. You'll have the actual physical label that goes on the pie on the page. You'll have the ingredients that go into it. You have the process of making the product, and you have you know the, 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 the final outcome of what it should be. Uh, this is where staff training comes in. That was probably back when we were were, were uh, 
starting to really grow as a business. This was probably the most critical uh, stage and, and hardest stage. You have different uh, team members and different chefs who are all, you know, uh, bringing their own unique stamp and, and skill set to the business. But if you have one chef uh, Monday to Thursday making lasagna one way, another chef Friday to Saturday making a different way, you know, that is, is, is the, the most important part of making your business plan. You really need to get your team together and get them talking about allergies, get them talking about the importance of compliance and getting them to understand from a business and a compliance point of view and a, and a life point of view as, you, as the risks involved in Alex and now have never been more transparent, especially with the Natasha's law. So get them understanding that the recipe that's developed is the recipe that this business is going forward. If, if you have a, a staff member who is really keen on a different type of thing, then you bring that back to the product development stage, go through, make another product, a different pie, call it a different name, but let them know that uh, the whatever recipe uh, sheet is put up that day for with the product list, that they must comply with our recipe uh, compliance. Uh, not only from a compliance point of view, but from a business point of view, you won't realize the benefits this has. If you have a customer who's uh, buying a product and they like, and they're buying it one week and it's beautiful, they're buying it next week, and it's, you know, that doesn't taste the same. That is hurting your business. If customers want uh, familiarity. They want to know that every time they buy a product, they are confident that that is the same product they bought last month, last year, five years ago. You know that is the the, the most uh, critical, uh, unique selling point we feel we have as a business. We uh, pride ourselves in the consistency of our products and how we are can offer the customer the the confidence and support that they are buying a product that they know is made in uh, the best possible way with the best ingredient but also a consistent manner with complete complete compliance uh, thing that's uh, often overlooked especially now with the exit protocols there's a number of shortages in certain ingredients this is key for you to talk to the staff members who do the ordering and who do maybe the checking in of your products. Uh, a number of wholesalers now will send, if you order, for example, a bullion for a soup, they may send a replacement bullion of a different brand. Now, staff may not realize, oh, it's a bullion, but it's the same thing. Like that bullion could be night and day different to the bullion you have in your ingredients. One could be gluten free, one could be not, one could. So it's key to. Uh, De not only deal with your wholesalers, uh, we, all our suppliers, we have a strict uh, no non-replacement. Uh, so if, if the thing is out of stock, they know to get in contact with us. If there is a product that is being delisted, again, that is where you have to go back to the start of the process, creating the product. If there's an ingredient that is no longer in use, you basically have to have the mindset that you're now creating a different product. So back to the initial stage of production, if it's only one ingredient, and you're happy with the flavor and texture you're getting out of that product, then get that group together, send it off as we do to uh, the company who will bring the ingredients back together, change all the, 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 the right uh, info and will keep you right. And uh, not only for the safety of your customers, but for the for, for, for your consistency of your business, for, for all the businesses to succeed. Uh, uh, consistency is key. And, uh, I hope this gives people watching a wee bit of on the ground uh, background and uh, how to try and be compliant. Uh, I did mention the utilize your device here, Joe. You, a lot of uh, things that your age will come with are best practice may not be in law, but kind of this best practice is usually soon to be law or will help your business. So uh, you find that. Uh, especially with, with COVID and, and, and the change of business model, like no EHO wants to come into your business and close it down. Uh, you know, if you take the advice coming from them, which they are then getting from the FSA and, and other local authorities, you, you really need to listen to what they're saying and try and have the mindset of taking a proactive approach to what is coming ahead from the business. Because uh, at the end of the day, for your business to succeed, you need to be compliant. And if you're not compliant in these areas, I mean, you're not going to have a business, not, not in the long term. So uh, the, the initial investment in time and the resources can seem uh, significant, but once you're over that initial stage, the cost of doing uh, being compliant comes way, 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 way down. And it, you know, it's, it, it definitely is the, it's the right thing to do that. But 
uh, look, thank you for being invited on here today by Zita and Steve. And any questions uh, that I want to be to answer, but thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks very much, James. And uh, that's very insightful. I'm sure there'll be a few questions coming. Um, and while my tummy is rumbling looking at that slide, I am going to hand over to, to Zita just to give us a little flavour of how we can help you uh, within CAFRI if, if it's required. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I really hope that you are enjoying this morning's event um, and you are finding it useful. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to remind you to make use of the Q&A function to ask all of your burning questions. This is your chance. So your Q&A button should be at the bottom right hand side of your screen if you're on your computer or your laptop. Or if you're on a mobile device, it'll be on in the middle at the bottom of your screen. It may be hiding behind three little dots, so click on those. And if you are struggling to find it, just message me in the chat and I'll make sure your question is asked. So my name is Zita McNocker and I'm a food technologist with CAFRE. CAFRE is the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise. And we're made up from three campuses. So we have Greenmount, just outside Antrim, uh, which focuses on agriculture and horticulture. We have Enniskillen, where the focus is on everything equine. And last, but by no means least, we have Lockray, just outside Cookstown, where we focus on food. So some of you may be familiar with Caffrey Lockray, but some of you may not realise the business support we can offer to local food companies. Most people are aware that we educate students in food related disciplines, but we also support the Northern Ireland agri food industry through our food technology branch. We have 22 food technologists on hand to help you with all your food related queries. In terms of allergens, we've helped clients ensure their labels meet all mandatory requirements, including allergen declarations. We can also give practical advice and support on managing allergens within your business and help you to complete allergen risk assessments. In some cases, we've also helped businesses to remove allergens from their recipes through the new product development process. We can also help you with guidance on food safety and quality systems, product development, shelf life testing, sensory assessments, and the ability to create product samples within our state of the art facilities. We have sector specific teams of technologists that help food companies across the entire length and breadth of the country alongside our training team. Our training tra team trains online at Lockery and can travel to your site uh, to train your employees when restrictions allow. We offer food safety, understanding HACCP, and a course that may be of particular interest to this audience, the Level 2 Award in Identifying and Controlling Allergen Risks. The next offer of this course is in November, and this will be delivered online with a face-to-face -face option if restrictions permit. Further information on our training courses can be found on the CAFRE website, which is www.cafre.ac.uk. And here we have a few pictures of the facilities at Lockery. Our Food Innovation Centre houses three development kitchens with a range of equipment that you would find in a commercial kitchen. This allows us to start off development projects at kitchen concept stage and test them out in our sensory assessment suite. Our Food Technology Centre contains separate pilot scale plants for the meat, dairy, bakery, beverage and fruit and veg sectors. These areas allow us to upscale concepts from the kitchen, create samples and overcome any upscaling challenges. More information about our facilities and equipment can be found again on the CAFRE website. Currently, the Food Technology branch is working in a blended manner, with time spent on site but also working from home. We would be more than happy to help you with any queries relating to allergens and labelling. Please feel free to contact us on our email address, which is lockery.foodtechnology at dira-ni.gov.uk, or alternatively, you can contact us through the website. So thank you all for listening, and I'll hand back to Peter. Thanks, Ada. And uh, I think it would be remiss of me not to give our courses a plug as well. So if you have any budding food technologists, 
who have just received their GCSE results or their A level results, please ask them to get in contact because we have we have some spaces available for back to class in uh, September. So uh, now we're coming to a very important part of, of the session and uh, we have got lots of questions and uh, I'd like to just thank um, the 170 odd participants this morning, uh, many of whom have sent in questions. Um, I'm going to leave the challenge of uh, putting the questions uh, to the panel uh, to Nula, who's kindly volunteered. Uh, so I'll hand over to you, Nula, and I think we're, we're at the situation where if we can't answer all of our questions today, you're going to uh, let the folks know how they can uh, of some of their very specific queries answered. Yeah, um, thank, thanks, Peter. Yeah, um, we've been looking at the questions that um, has been sent through throughout the session, and there's some really good, really good questions, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, but for those that we don't get answered, um, we would really recommend that you contact your district council, uh, your environmental health team in your district council for very you know, business specific related questions who are more than happy to provide you with the specific advice. Um, as Steve mentioned during his section on our FSA presentation, there's an awful lot of information on our, um, at the FSA's website at food.gov.uk forward slash PPDS. And um, we also have our dedicated PPDS email address, uh, which Steve mentioned um, earlier on as well. So if we don't get to your question today because of the limited time, please do use those um, those avenues and what we'll we'll tr try and answer as best we can. And actually, sorry, Zeta had also mentioned during her presentation about uh, CAFRI support. So there's lots of options for you. But if we move on to the, the questions that we have, so for question number one, I'm going to ask Steve to answer this question. So, um, so packaging and labeling for leafy vegetables, if selling in a punnet box or an unwrapped tied bunch, what are the, uh, if, if there's any packaging and labeling guidelines? Okay, thanks, Nula. Okay, so we heard earlier that um, what, what was the definition of PPDS would be, uh, and that is food that is packed before being offered for sale by the same food business to the final consumer on the same site premises or from a movable temporary premises such as market stalls. So that's PPDS, um, but it also needs to meet the definition of pre-packed, um, which is found in Article 2.2 of the Food Information for Consumers European Regulation 1169-2011. And that says food is pre-packed uh, when it is put into packaging before being offered for sale, is fully or partly enclosed by the packaging. It cannot be altered by, uh, without opening or changing the packaging and is ready for sale to the final consumer. So in respect of the question about uh, leafy vegetables in a punnet or a box, if they're in an open punnet or box, i.e. with no lid or no cling film, or you may be having a, an unwrapped tied bunch of produce such as spring onions, then these wouldn't meet the definition of pre-packed and would not be pre-packed for direct sale foods. Some foods, uh, Article 19 of the Food Information for Consumers regs, talks about fresh fruit and vegetables which have not been peeled, cut or similarly treated. They don't need to carry an ingredients list. So in summary, from the description of the question, leafy vegetables in a, in a panad or box, provided they're open, um, then it would not be caught by PPDS. Brilliant, Steve. Thank you very much. Um, the second question that we have seen, um, I'm going to take a stab at answering that one um, in terms of must may contain traces of, oh, sorry, must may contain traces of or similar wording ingredients be listed. So statements such as may contain or not suitable for um, that appear in the packaging of pre-packed foods are known as precautionary allergen labeling, uh, which I mentioned during my presentation. Um, they tell consumers about the unintentional presence of allergens, usually from unavoidable cross-contamination with allergens as the food is prepared. Um, for PPDS food, we do advise that these types of statements are best placed on the label of the food. Um, however, operators can also communicate this information 
in different ways, for example, verbally by staff or in writing with signs on display. Um, this information should only be provided if a risk of allergy and cross-contamination has been identified following a thorough risk assessment for how food is prepared and handled. So any precautionary allergen information on the ingredients you use in your food, such as tinned or packaged goods, must be passed on to the consumer. Um, and as I mentioned before um, during my presentation, um, the use of precautionary allergen labeling where there's not a real risk of allergen cross-contamination could be considered misleading food information. So that's something for uh, businesses to consider as well. Um, the, Third question that we have is, will consideration be given to any compliance delays as a result of the extended lockdown for the food service sector? And Steve, um, I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind um, answering this question as well, please. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so we would expect uh, district councils and other local authorities to take this into account when advising businesses or when considering whether they would issue an improvement notice to business. Apart from that, um, business should, businesses should endeavour to make every effort to, to ensure that they're compliant from the 1st of October. And we'd recommend that you contact the, your local environmental health team in your district council for further advice and check out the, the resources that we've mentioned previously. Thank you, Steve. And um, so the next question that we have um, is, are there any plans to make a centralised UK system where a producer company would be required by law to upload their ingredient and allergen information for a product for smaller independent manufacturers to be able to obtain um, accurate information? Um, I'll um, I'll answer this one with, with a very short answer, which is there are currently no plans uh, to look at into developing such a system. But again, as I mentioned during my presentation, there are requirements on suppliers to uh, provide um, to, to provide this in this information when it, the food is going through the food chain. So these requirements remain um, with PPDS. OK, so the. But the fifth question that we have, again, Steve, I'm sending this one your way, mm -hmm. is, is there an exemption based on small quantities of PPDS products being made by small producers? Uh, thanks, Nula. Um, there are no exemptions for small quantities uh, for, to the PPDS requirements, and the requirements apply to all food, food businesses, uh, no matter how big or small they are. Um, any PPDS food must be labelled correctly. And as mentioned in the presentation, this must include all of the ingredients in the food in descending order of weight and allergens emphasised within the list of ingredients. There are some exemptions, as I mentioned, in terms of things like fresh fruit and vegetables uh, from listing having to have an um, ingredients list. Um, but reading the question slightly differently perhaps the uh, the person who submitted it meant um, small packages and there is in fact a small packages exemption um, where the food is packaged and the uh, container's larger surface is less than 10 centimeters squared um, then the ingredients list can be left off that packaging because the packaging may be too small to contain it but the, uh, the ingredients information would have to be provided by other means um, or at the customer's request. Allergen information must still be uh, labelled on the product. Um, in some cases, the presence of um, allergens um, would need to be um, on whatever, whatever. And sometimes the um, so if you if you take um, uh, followed by the name of the substance, for example, uh, contains celery, uh, contains fish, and and there are minimum font sizes that apply to to labelling that, as has been mentioned earlier by Nula as well. Thank you. That's great, Steve. Um, and I I know that I'd seen another question that asked for further information on the minimum font size. So the the information on minimum. Uh, mandatory information for minimum font size is in Article 9.1 of the Food Information to Consumers. So, um, for the person who had asked that question, um, that that's somewhere where they can uh, where they can go, or else happy to to take to take that um, separately at a, at a later date. 
and also I've just um James has had had to leave us. He has had a um a, another thing that he has to attend. So just to thank him very much for his attendance today and his really really useful presentation. Um, but now we'll move on to the, the next question, which is. Uh, which Steve, this is coming to you again. Sorry about that. But are there any grants available for any additional costs created by these changes? So if a if a business is under the VAT threshold and therefore can't claim it back, um, is there any additional cost uh, be, due to the extra strain on small businesses? Unfortunately, um, there are no grants available for these changes. Um, but we do recommend that you discuss any concerns with your local district councils. Thanks. Um, so the next question that we have, which I will, um, which I'll answer, is there's some mixed answers around. Sorry, there's some mixed answers to the law around hot food counters. For example, pre-made breakfast wraps, paninis, sausage baps with paper or cling wrapping on same, or loaded fries in individual containers. Do they require a label with full ingredients and allergen information? So a food that is packed before being offered for sale by the same food business to the final consumer on the same site premises or from a movable temporary premises such as market stalls is pre-packed for direct sale. So for food to be pre-packed for direct sale, it needs to meet the definition of pre-packed in Article 22 of uh, EU Regulation 1169-2011, which we know as the Food Information to Consumers or the FIC regulations. So food is considered pre-packed when it's put into packaging before being offered for sale and is either fully or partly enclosed by the packaging, cannot be altered without opening or changing the packaging, and is ready for sale to the final consumer. If the breakfast baps and paninis, etc., are wrapped in paper or cling film that fully encloses the food in anticipation of a customer order, then they are um, likely to be PPDS and will require food ingredients and allergen information. So with cling film, if the food is completely or partially enclosed by cling film or other packaging before it's ordered and is ready for presentation to the consumer and the food can't be altered without opening or changing the packaging, it is PPDS food. Um, if an item is removed from cling film before it is presented to the consumer, then this is not PPDS food. This is non pre packed food, and so allergen information must be provided in another form. Um, okay, so uh, Peter, I'm just going to come back to you here quickly because I, I've just noticed the time, and I know that we're um, we're we're running over a little bit, but I don't know what. Um, it's entirely up to you, Neil. If you want to take another, maybe one more question, and then you can maybe tell the the folks how they could have any specific questions answered. Is there that's, an email address or a contact address? That's perfect. That's what I'll, I will do. Um. So, um, the the next question that I have here is um a business that uses NGCI, which is non gluten containing ingredients, on our current labeling to highlight to customers. Which products do not contain gluten? Uh, will we still be able? To, will we still be allowed to use this after the first of October? Um, Steve, I was going to come to you for this, um, if that's okay, or else I can answer it. Whatever suits you best. No, that, that's fine. Um, the, the short answer, due to lack of time, is, is yes. You can. There's nothing to prevent you continuing to use that statement. Um, if the product is caught by the PPDS changes, then you need to label it with the name of the food, the list of ingredients, and emphasised ingredients as well. That's great, Steve. Um, so I, I apologise, there was a lot of questions that we didn't get time to answer today. But just before I pass back to Peter for, for his closing remarks, um, I would just like to flag again um, the guidance that's available on the FSA website at food.gov.uk forward slash PPDS. Uh, we also have our dedicated PPDS email address, which is PPDS at food.gov.uk. Um, we, we work very closely with our district councils who have told us that they are more than happy to provide advice specific to your business. And so would also suggest that you contact your local environmental health officer um, and the 
it, the email address that Zita said for Caffrey, I've forgotten here, with, with, um, but it is all on the presentation, which we know will be available after. So there are very, um, there, there are many ways to, to get in touch with us. Um, so we'd really like to thank you all for your time this morning and apologies about um, the, that we didn't get answering more questions. Okay. And I'll pass Peter. Sorry, Peter. Thanks, thanks, thanks Lola. You know, no, look, my, all I'd like to do is sum up with a few maybe take home messages for, for, for all of us. Um, the very beginning, Tim really spelt out why we need Natasha's law, you know, and some of those figures are staggering where we have one child in every class with a, with a food allergy and the numbers that are increasing and, and the fact that you don't have to be at any particular stage in your life to develop a, a food allergy. I think that's a real take home message. Um, at the moment, we have 14 declared allergens, but the fact that there are 170 known uh, allergenic compounds out there from foods is, is a bit of a wake up call. And it just shows you that we need to be very, very alert and in tune um, to make sure that uh, we don't harm anyone with a food sensitivity. It's really reassuring, though, to hear the channels that are being used by FSA in terms of the resources. And I, I thought the uh, uh, the little decision tree that was in the middle of your presentation, Nola, would be very, very useful for anyone who is in doubt of whether their food is PBDS or, or, or not. And I would encourage everyone to use those resources. James's presentation was really useful. Um, you know, the fact that he realizes as a business person that PPDS foods, you know, businesses are starting to rely on that as a, as a major income stream but we have responsibilities. And really his work with legislation, with allergen legislation has gone back to 2011. And all we're really doing, and, and the FSA will probably have spelt this out as well, allergen legislation is there. We're just tightening down the avenues and the danger areas for consumers who, who may buy something unaware that, there's, that there is a, an allergen component within it. I was really impressed that James is product development process actually takes into account from the beginning when they're developing a product, the fact that there could be potentially allergens within it. But he really emphasized one really important ingredient in the whole thing, and that's staff training. You know, with all the best will in the world, we have, uh, we have, we have good allergy control and good labeling, but it's so important that we share this information uh, with our staff. So before we leave today, and thank you everyone for, for attending, I have one more job for you, for you to do. But first of all, I'd just like to thank our speakers, Tim and James. And also, um, I'd also like to, to thank uh, Tracy, who's not here today, uh, and all the speakers from the FSA. Um, we've worked really, really well together, and hopefully we'll do that in the future as well. Uh, thanks to Zeta for keeping everything in control, and for Laura Brown as well, and Caffrey working well in the background. So as soon as Zeta closes this event, you will be taken to an exit screen with just a small number of questions, a couple of questions, but we'd really appreciate your feedback. So I'm going to ask Zeta now to close the event and I'll send all of you my best wishes for the rest of your day. Thanks very much. <laughs>